This is your life and down there Buckingham Palace, where today some of those in the New Year's Honours list are attending an investiture by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. One of those is the man I'm after. He's been honoured with the OBE. He's a man who has saved scores of wildlife species from extinction and in so doing has led expeditions to the jungles and the forests of the world. Now, we're timing our arrival that the investiture itself is over and the cars should be beginning to leave the palace and we're looking for one particular car and one particular person. And I think, is that, that's the man, that's our car. Let's get right on its trail, that's it. And here's the plan. The car heading with our man and his wife for a hotel and a bubbly celebration with a few special friends will stop short of that hotel. At the side entrance of our television theater, in fact, where the special friends already are instead. I'll be close behind with my extra celebration surprise for his special day. Let's see what happens. Congratulations, Jerry. There's more champagne on ice inside. But oh, no, I've been avoiding your wife, you. Lee. I've been avoiding you for years. Author, broadcaster, internationally famous wildlife conservationist, Gerald Earl. On this great day, this is your life. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, boy. I'll kill you when you get to home. <laughs> As if Congratulations I have... again. Thank you. As if I haven't like had enough to do today. <laughs> Jerry, your celebrations are starting a little earlier than planned with your good friends, Lord and Lady Creighton, John Hartley, who was at the palace with you, Christopher McAllows, Jonathan Harris, Philippa Webb, Susan Davis, Michael Hyde, and your wife, Lee. And of course, Lee, today you were able to uh, turn the tables on Jerry. Absolutely, Eamon. Uh, one of his greatest pleasures in life, aside from looking after animals, of course, is to pull little tricks on people. And I remember the time uh, in North Carolina when I was finishing up my studies, he deliberately showed up two days early for a date with me. And so I was so shocked and amazed I couldn't even open the door to let him in. <laughs> so thanks a lot for today. I can get my own back on him. You yeah. wait, you Didn't wait, I? you wait. <laughs> You're in trouble. Well, Gerald Durrell, this is your life. And on a day when your achievements for the conservation of world life have been honored by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, let's begin with a visit to the place, to the people, and to the animals closest to your heart, to the Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust and Jersey Zoological Park, where you collect from all over the world wildlife species threatened with extinction. A unique sanctuary described by you in the title of just one of your best-selling books as Menagerie Manor. Dozens of animals of all sorts and descriptions looked after by a devoted staff. Not least, your longest serving staff member, Jerry Mallinson. Hello, Jerry, and congratulations. Goodness me, things have changed here dramatically since I presented myself for a temporary job for six months, some 24 years ago. In fact, I remember turning up and finding a whole lot of chickens around my feet, grubbing about, and I thought to myself, goodness me, so this is a zoo, when I realized I had presented myself at a farm next door. Thanks to your tremendous tenacity and vision, the Trust has developed beyond our wildest dreams. Now let us take you over to Betty Renner in the office. Hello, Mr. D. It must be more than 20 years since I started work here in this office. It can't be every office in the world where you get the occasional bear peeping in through the office window, or creatures as exotic as this popping in to see you. And now Shet Mallet would like a word with you over at the birdhouse. Gerald, do you remember back in 1966 when we got these 
two pairs of white-eared pheasants from Peking Zoo. We pulled our savings. They cost us 500 pounds a pair. Hugh turned to me and said, Shep, that was money well spent. And Jerry, they've drafted in special volunteers to look after the animals tonight so that they can be here from your wildlife trust. Jeremy Mallinson, Betty Renoff, and Jeff Mallet. And with them, Papa Weller, Joan Vance, and Simon Hicks. One of your favorite animals, Jerry, is Pongo, the gorilla. And we have a picture of him here taken 20 years ago as a baby being cuddled by a famous film star friend of yours. And just flown in from Stockholm, she's here, international film director, Mai Zetterling. Hi. He's the gorilla. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, as a family friend for many years, of course, yes. you were one of the first visitors to Jerry Zoo, yes? Well, I believe so. And, uh, well, I have two headlines as a personal friend of Jerry's. And my two headlines are food and wickedness. And I don't quite know what he likes the most, food or wickedness. <laughs> <clears throat> well, he's a great cook. But when I visit him first in Jersey, I think the, f the animals got the better food than the, than the people, actually. <laughs> but uh, later on in France, where I also live sometimes, and he lives and you live, he cooks superbly stuffed quails with eggs. And if you don't eat two stuffed quails, I don't think you'll ever ask back again. That's what I feel. As I say, I don't quite know what he likes the best. <laughs> Wicked man. <laughs> Thank you, my Zetterling. Well, Gerald Earl, this is your life, and you were born in Jamsapur in India on January 7th, 1925, son of an English civil engineer. Your father died when you were just two years old, and you returned with your family to England. From your earliest childhood, you were fascinated by animals. In fact, Jerry, one of the very first words you spoke was zoo. From a home in Bournemouth, your sister Margot, and with her, her son Jerry. <laughs> Now, uh, Margot, you're serious about uh, zoo being one of the very first words Absolutely. in Jerry's vocabulary. Absolutely, Eamon. <laughs> uh, once Jerry had introduced himself to the zoo, every time he went this out... This was in India? This was in India, yeah. in Jamshedpur. He used to shout loudly for zoo, zoo, and we could go in no other direction. And then when the, f when the family returned to England, of course, he kept up his interest in animals. Yes, he was equally as bad. He, all the matchboxes were filled with spiders. We used to have to play circuses every day where he would stand on a box. And I, needless to say, was the only audience while some <laughs> reptile or, or insect was taken out and <laughs> went through a performance. Well, now, Jerry, someone else well remembers your early passion for collecting specimens and matchboxes, someone who can't be here. But if you look at that screen, we're going to join him now at his home in uh, Sommier in France, distinguished, award-winning author, <laughs> your brother, of course, <laughs> Lawrence Sturrell. You devil. Hi there, Eamon, magician. Thank you. I have a chance to salute my brother on this momentous occasion when he's got this well-earned decoration and where I hope the animals are dancing in their cages in his zoo. Um, Jerry will recognize, won't you, Jerry, this kitchen here where you've executed so many marvelous curries and where we've had so many very pleasant episodes with the local wine. I must say that even in this kitchen, thinking back to your book, My Family and Other Animals, I can't pick up the matchbox without wondering whether a scorpion is going to come out of it as it did. It was the first and most momentous uh, uh, story that occurs in your book, and which is really truthful in the sense that it's given me a, a sort of trauma. I can't still pick up a matchbox without wondering if it's got a scorpion in it. Anyway, Jerry, here's pledging you in our local brew, Pique Saint-Loup. 
all the best. Thank you, Lawrence Doyle in some years. <laughs> school days in Bournemouth are happy times for you, Jay. You must have liked school because you were always bringing me presents. She was your teacher 50 years ago from a home in Bournemouth at the age of 87, Ethel Squire. <laughs> He ran up to you there and called you something. What did he call you? Squig. Squig. <laughs> tell me, what about those presents? What sort of presents did Jerry bring you at school? Oh, matchboxes full of insects. <laughs> various types. Earwigs and spiders and woodlice. And <laughs> the most difficult to be enthusiastic over was when you brought the box of little grey slugs. <laughs> But you did your best, Greg. Oh, I did my best, <laughs> yes, rather. We used to talk about them, and then they went in the garden. That's right. <laughs> you, always, oh, you always used to say, I think they'll be happier in the garden. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ethel Squire. It's quick, eh? When you're aged eight, your family's on the move again, this time to the Greek island of Corfu, which becomes your home for six years and opens up a new world of natural history for you. There you are with your dog, Roger, on one of your expeditions, and here you are with your very first wildlife friend, a barn owl. Now, when you were only 10, and as millions read in that enchanting book of yours that Lawrence just mentioned, My Family and Other Animals, you strike up a lasting friendship with someone who will ask you, no, not to be in the best of health at the moment, but of whom you wrote, one of the most remarkable men I ever met. He would extract magic that even Merlin would have envied. And if you look at that screen, you can see again yeah. that Corfu doctor who became a father figure to you, now 87, Theodore Stephanides. Hello, Jerry. I remember how thrilled you were when you discovered that I shared your enthusiasm for natural history. We spent so many happy times together, and you became like a son to me. I remember how you came to ask me to solve a mystery that had been perplexing you. You'd been collecting tadpoles and put them in a bucket of water in your home so as to watch them turn into frogs. But the next morning, they had all disappeared. And this happened several times. Well, I came to inspect your tadpoles and found that they were in reality mosquito larvae. <laughs> that's why they had flown away. And that's exactly what you had to do when your mother discovered that you'd been breeding mosquitoes right there in the house. <laughs> Such happy, happy times. Have a good time tonight. Thank you, Theodore Stephanides. <laughs> At the outbreak of war, Jerry, you move with your family back to London, and the teenage Jerry Durrell gets his first job. What was that? Uh, in a pet shop. How strange, yes. <laughs> <laughs> then you become a student keeper at Whipsnade Zoo, but in 1947, determined to start a zoo of your own. Now, to raise the money to do so, you set off on the first of your animal collecting expeditions commissioned by zoos in England. For the next two years, you travel to the Cameroons and to Guiana, bringing back dozens of wild animals of every description. Now, Margo, where did he keep them? He kept them in the back garden in Bournemouth, in the garage, which had to be specially insulated, in the porch, and the more precious kind in the house. <laughs> well, that, that first expedition to the Cameroons leads you to your first book, the overloaded ark. More travels to the Argentine, Paraguay, Australia, New Zealand lead to more bestsellers, including that world book's choice, My Family and Other Animals. You become increasingly concerned about wildlife threatened with extinction and set out to collect a vast variety of them. An early expedition in 1962 takes you to New Zealand, to Mount Cook, in search of the kia, the mountain parrot. And Jerry, it's perhaps just as well those parrots can't talk. He was with you on that expedition more than 20 years ago, New Zealand wildlife officer. We've flown him 12,000 miles from Wellington tonight, Brian Bell. <laughs> Brian, why 
suppose it's just as well those uh, Mount Cook parrots can't talk. Well, they'd, be still, they'd still be telling jokes about Gary. <laughs> because we had done a lot of trips around the country, at difficult spots, climbing little islands and little pieces of rock coming away in your hand all the time. And Mount Cook was the easy job. There's always parrots at Mount Cook, except when Jerry came. <laughs> and we climbed halfway around the mountain looking for them, and we'd actually given up. We were going to go home. And somebody tipped us off. The kitchen maid might help. Next morning, we got up. Jerry looked out the window. There was the kitchen maid feeding a dozen or so kids <laughs> just down to feed. Them. He was ecstatic. Uh, it was fantastic. But the kids know when they're onto a good thing. But they also had a little mischievous twinkle in their eye, which they always have. And they said, I fooled you that time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian Bell. Thank you. Well, Jerry, you achieved your dream of your wildlife sanctuary, but in terms of your personal life, the cost is high. Constant money worries, illness, the breakup of your first marriage. But your quest to save endangered species drives you on. You also go on lecture tours, including America, where you meet Lee, herself a zoologist. In 1979, you're married in Memphis, Tennessee. The two of you go on an expedition to Round Island off the coast of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. You, Jerry, had just arrived on the island by the only possible route, and Lee follows. <laughs> this is um, a much easier method of getting on shore than it used to be in the old days, when you had to jump from the boat. But it makes you feel somewhat like a pantomime fairy. how Lee is being very nonchalant about this, although she's never done it before. <laughs> well, Jerry, in Mauritius, when you untwine yourself, you went in search of two threatened species, the pink pigeon and the golden bat. Now, the bat gave you quite a problem, but first of all, you had to get on its scent. But I'm afraid the tactics I advise you to use caused you a bit of a stink. He was with you on that expedition seven years ago in charge of forest conservation in Mauritius, and we've flown him 6,000 miles to be here tonight. Wahab wow. Awad Ali. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us, Wahab, were the uh, tactics successful? Yes, I was delighted you got the golden bat. Yes, indeed. The bait we used was a fruit, tropical fruit called... That's revolting. Jackfruit. <laughs> in any case, you ordered it, and we sent it to you in your hotel room. <laughs> and uh, from then onwards... How revolting your room, smell, was it? It wasn't too bad. <laughs> oh, well, don't, you, don't, don't you tell lies. It's revolting. <laughs> it smells like a newly opened grave. <laughs> <laughs> your room smelled it. <laughs> your hotel room. My clothes smelled your it. Your clothes as well. <laughs> and the lounge. Yeah. Airport lounge. And then and you went back. Yeah, but do you remember what you did to me after that? Well, I did remember. You had the curry and you enjoyed it. You <laughs> ate it voraciously. <laughs> well, that's, that was because the curry was so good. When we were told that the, one of the ingredients was a jackfruit, <laughs> you went green. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wahab. What are they? <laughs> well, Jerry, wherever you've traveled all over the world, you've uh, coaxed governments into becoming involved in wildlife captive breeding schemes for endangered species based on your own work in Jersey. But more than that, you've encouraged the people of those countries to take on that vital task themselves. And in the past six years, your sanctuary in Jersey has taken students from India, Hong Kong, Jamaica, Pakistan, South America, Canada. But the very first student to whom your wildlife trust gave a scholarship, paying all his expenses for a year, came from Mauritius. And Jerry, working with you, was the happiest year of my life. We've flown him too from Mauritius, your very first international student, Yusuf Mungru. Yusuf, nice to see you. <laughs> Well, Yusuf, your work nowadays back home in Mauritius is in fact based on what you learned from Jerry. Yes, thanks to the teaching of Jerry, who is a really dedicated man. He, he always used to tell me that, you know, he, his sanctuary will no more be in need when other governments like mine will take over and protect their own wildlife. And this is exactly what we are doing in Mauritius. Thank you, Yusuf Thank you.
Jerry, in a magazine interview, someone was asked the old question, if she were a castaway on a desert island, who would she choose in the whole world for company? Even though you'd never met, she'd no hesitation in choosing you. And I was absolutely thrilled, Jerry, when you wrote to tell me that ours was a mutual admiration society of two. Who else but that delightful and talented actress, Dinah Sheridan? <laughs> Well, Diana, firstly, your, your reasons for making Jerry your castaway choice. Well, though I'd never met him, I knew he'd be the right person to recognize whatever animal came out of the bushes <laughs> and what to do with it. <laughs> Eat it. Uh, well, that was my hope. <laughs> and the other reason was that I knew from your writing that you'd be the most amusing and delightful companion. Oh. And when he read the interview, Diana, he wrote to you, didn't he? He arranged you to come and see you at the West End Theatre where you were appearing. Yes, he did. Yes, he came to see me in, in a, a play I was doing, and he sent me red roses, he sent me champagne, and a sweet letter which said, the loudest applause will be mine. I'm on my knees before you. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the show, as he came into my dressing room, he was on his knees. <laughs> <laughs> I might say it was a very gallant, very gallant and sweet thing to do, but uh, Lee was with him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Diana Sheridan. <laughs> Jerry, before we close, in the vital work of preserving world wildlife, I know of someone you first met 35 years ago who earned your greatest respect and affection and I know your evening would not be complete without that brilliant artist, broadcaster, and founder and current vice chairman of the World Wildlife Fund, Sir Peter Scott. So, Peter, what, in your opinion, is the very special achievement of Jerry Durrell? Oh, I think, uh, for me, breeding his rare animal species, the, the endangered species, I mean, when he started doing it, you know, that marvellous zoo that he's created there uh, in Jersey, we didn't believe he'd be able to breed half the things he thought he would. And he confounded us all. He managed to breed them all, or nearly all, and this is a tremendous achievement, and I congratulate him enormously. And, and indeed, generations to come will be grateful to you for all of that. Quite apart from the, the, the books that you'll write, which I know have conditioned so many people to like animals in the sort of way that I like them and you like them. And finally, of course, um, to say how wonderful I think the zoo that you've created is, because that's a great, great achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Sir Peter Scott. <laughs> now there, Jerry, we close, except to mention uh, that man you describe as the most important man in my life. Without him, I would have achieved nothing. A short while ago, Jerry, he decided he was feeling well enough to be here after all. At the marvelous age of 87, Dr. Theodore Stefanides. Gerald Darrell, honored today with the OBE. This is your life. Thank you very much, Anna.
Our midweek sports special tonight at 10.35, Brian Moore introduces a double bill of football. From Wembley, England's fifth match under new manager Bobby Robson. Exclusive highlights of their British Championship game against Wales. England haven't won this fixture in 10 years, and commentator Martin Tyler will be at Wembley. There'll also be action from one of the night's big domestic cup ties, plus ice hockey action from Streatham. There's terrific sporting action in midweek sports special, tonight at 10.35 on ITV. A treat for the soccer fans there, but earlier in the evening, at 9 o'clock, we find out what's happening on the home front. Why are you going to London? What is the purpose of your visit? To see my daughter. <laughs> You're mumbling again. You want to open your mouth a bit wider when you speak. I'm going to visit my daughter. I am going to my daughter's wedding, you old bat. I beg your pardon? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I'm going to my... I'm going to London to see my son. He's a writer. We'll be picking up the stitches of life rich, life's rich tapestry in the home front at nine o'clock. And before that, at eight, Bruce Forsyth surrounds himself with some of his favourite things, funny men and beautiful women in Forsyth's Follies at eight. And in a moment, we're off down Coronation Street. That's after the break. You expect a local bank to operate at a local level, but at your local Nat West... Seventh floor, foreign exchange dealing, traveller's check. There's a bit more going on. Fourteenth floor, saving schemes, small business loans, exporting to Japan. 23rd, medium-term loans to industry, shipping. Which floor, sir? Well, actually, I'm going prospecting for gold. Oh, you'll want our mining section, sir. Going down. Behind every NatWest branch is Britain's biggest banking network. NatWest, the action bank. Okay. Why put up with cheap videotape when you could be watching Fuji? Fuji videotapes. Clean up your picture, polish up your sound. Hang on. Hello. Hello, Margaret. What? Hello, Margaret. Leslie. I'll tell you where I was later. Did we win? Yes. Will you be using Stork SB Margarine in the future? Yes. Mm. Really? I shall. No, it does taste better. I yeah. must admit, I hadn't actually ever compared two like that, yeah. side by side. Well, you wouldn't really lurk into the kitchen and no. try Stork SB against another one, would you? The secret Stork speaker. <laughs> Stork SB Margarine. More and more people are tasting the difference. Wake up to Magnet and Southern's windows for a fresh outlook. A modern outlook. An old-fashioned outlook. A double-glazed outlook. Wake up to Magnet and Southern's real oak kitchens, Hessian look kitchens, and the biggest choice of doors, posh doors, front doors, back doors, matter doors, patio doors, next doors. Wake up to Magnet and Southern. Great, yes, and now there's new Bachelor's Copper Soup Special, too. Exciting new soups with lots of tasty goodies you can see. Great, Minestrone Special. Feast your eyes on those vegetables, ring noodles, and crispy croutons. Mmm, French onion special. There's crunchy croutons and Emmental cheese in there. Croutons. Noodles. In a cup, like Bachelor's That's special. When you want a really big bite, bite into a new nuts bar. Inside, you'll find crunchy hazelnuts, light chocolate flavor nougat, chewy caramel, and thick milk chocolate. In fact, nuts is a big enough bite for any appetite. Mm. I recommend the porridge, the halibut is nice, you can say without any reply. But show them Kellogg's bran flakes, that's a different matter, they'll all reply. They're tasty, tasty, very, very tasty, they're very tasty. Would you care for yogurt? The green flakes are nice, the continental breakfast ain't bad. But show them Kellogg's bran flakes, that's a different matter, they'll all reply. They're tasty, tasty, very, very tasty. Kellogg's bran flakes. You know, this could catch on.
Six o'clock this morning, that would have put a bit of colour in your cheeks. Just yeah, well, I'll see you now. Yeah, right. Hey! Hey! Everything all right then? I brought the invoices and the accruals for January so we can get them out of the way to start with. Hey? You did say that we'd spend the morning looking at the accounts. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, right then, uh, where should we start from? Well... And I don't want you sat there all morning, neither. You can get this table sided and then out cleaning some windows, right? Yeah. You don't have to stop and keep him company. Don't worry about me, I won't be here. Ten minutes, I'm rendezvousing with the wagon at the top of the road. Right, well, see you take him out with you when you go. Ta-da, then. Ta-da. Stanley. You will be collecting some money today, won't you? Because there's a little matter of uh, ten quid still outstanding. I know. Only we were talking this morning, and one of the lad's brothers, he's on the windows, you know. Only this lad, he not only does the windows, but he runs a motor car and has holidays in New York, and I know. I mean, you must be going wrong somewhere. Yeah. You know, you ought to get one of them time and motion fellas. Tell you the best place to lean your ladder and when to hang out your chamois. How old is this chap you're talking about? Oh, Jacko's brother, on the windows. Ah.